We've all been told for decades that the murders, phone calls, and the letters were all the work of a single individual, a person calling himself the Zodiac, and there supposedly was never any doubt of that claim. When Thomas Henry Horn had published his work, revealing that there never was a Zodiac killer, only someone using the police files to write letters to newspapers pretending to be, it was not well received. Though I too was skeptical, I was also curious. This video is the second part of exploring the story of the Zodiac Killer, and I'll be focusing on the shooting at Blue Rock Springs Park, the victims, the phone calls, possible suspects, and of course, the letters. I can see the appeal of focusing on Darlene Farron to unravel the shooting at Blue Rock Springs Park. After all, it was her death that seemed to have prompted someone to start writing letters to the newspapers as Zodiac. And there have been rumors about her being involved with the occult, witnessing murders, and traveling across the country with an older man when she was a young teenager. Even though there isn't a clear motive in the murder of Darlene Farron, there were still possible suspects. A great deal of effort was spent focusing in on one suspect in particular, a bookkeeper slash office manager slash part-time bartender and former boiler maker at a steel mill named George Waters, who was alleged to have roughed up a woman who worked at a bar. And in 1964, he was arrested for violating a restraining order against his ex-wife. A number of people interviewed would come to point a finger in his direction, as it is relayed that George was a man who had made several attempts to date Darlene, something she supposedly never did. And according to some, her rejection had instilled a bitterness in George that might provide motivation for murder. There are also statements that George had even threatened Darlene, but it should be noted most of the people who offered this information about George and Darlene never actually witnessed any of these quarrels, only through second-hand stories or even third-hand, particularly regarding threats against her. But what may have really sparked investigators' interest in George Waters as a possible suspect was some information provided by Linda, Darlene's sister, at the scene of the shooting the morning of July 5th. Not only does she seem to have immediate suspicions of George Waters, but also told investigators he drove a brown car, possibly a Corvair. Hours earlier, Mike Mijot had relayed to first responders that the killer drove a brown car. Investigators started honing in on George within 48 hours, running background checks, making inquiries with former employers, monitoring his house, talking to neighbors. But not just Vallejo PD, or Solano County Sheriff's Office. There was already a third department involved in investigating the murder of Darlene Farron. Sure enough, Napa County Sheriff's Office had its hands in the case as early as July 7th. This is particularly noteworthy, as one of the facts used to debunk the hoax theory is that Napa County Sheriff's Office wasn't involved in the Zodiac murder investigations until the Lake Berryessa attack. As I show here, and in my first video, this is demonstrably false. Napa County Sheriff's Office was in fact participating in the investigations prior to Lake Berryessa and the letters. Vallejo PD made contact with George four days later, on July 11th, for questioning. He confirmed a lot of the information the police had already gathered. Jobs, meeting Dean Farron, and he spoke openly about Darlene Farron, noting that he met her at the beginning of 1969, admitting that he teased her, sometimes to her anger, and giving her rides home after work at Terry's restaurant. His story about the last time he saw Darlene matches perfectly with another statement made by a friend of Darlene's at Terry's restaurant. Bobby. And even though Linda had claimed George had a brown car, no other people interviewed mention a brown car, nor is it noted anywhere he actually owned a brown car. George was also at home with his recent wife, Judith, in Napa County the night of the shooting. He may have a history with women, but there's not a single piece of evidence he had anything to do with the murder of Darlene Farron. Friends of Darlene would provide more names and descriptions of a number of men who Darlene would be romantically involved with, and other men that seemed to only give her rights to work perhaps hoping to be more than friends, as one statement made by a co-worker at Terry's named Evelyn claimed that Darlene recently confided to her that her husband Dean didn't love her anymore, and that her second marriage was all but over. These other leads of a romantic interest, and even a suspected abortion were followed up on, but nothing tangible towards murder. And the mystery of a man in Darlene's life named Richard appears to be completely manufactured. There indeed was a man named Richard that lived near Darlene, and would give her rights to work. The police were able to identify him though, or at least had his license plate number. But Richard being described as six feet tall and slender hardly fits the description of the shooter. 
There is an interview from 1991 with the former Vallejo cop, who dated Darlene just prior to her murder, which was conducted well after rumors about her being involved with the occult, witnessing murders, and traveling across the country with an older man had been amplified by Robert Graysmith's very successful first book. These sensational rumors have only grown over the years, much to the detriment to solving this case, making imaginations run wild with speculation based on hearsay and innuendo. This interview only offers secondhand accounts of Darlene's life prior to her marriage to James Crabtree. In other words, it may be true that Darlene had told this information to Buzz Gordon. We do not know that Darlene was telling the truth to Buzz and he does specify that this information is secondhand. Buzz does provide some first-hand accounts that are far more plausible, however. As I discussed in my last video, the drug culture in the Bay Area was surging by 1969. In Napa County, there were a mere three drug-related arrests in 1963. But by 1968, there were 150. A 50-fold increase, and I suspect the figures in Solano County would be significantly worse. The Consumers Union Report of Licit and Illicit Drugs published in 1972 even notes the sudden spike in demand as a contributing factor in the marijuana shortage summer of 1969, without getting too lost in the weeds of drug statistics. Needless to say, I do find Buzz Gordon's claims of a 22-year-old in Vallejo 1969 experimenting with drugs to be far more credible, particularly because he would have first-hand knowledge. And it is a little convenient she stopped using drugs while dating a cop leaving his own history with drug use suspect. And given the addictive effects of amphetamines, I also find the rumors of Darlene using drugs after the relationship had ended to also be reasonably credible. Though there is no documentation of drug use for Darlene Farron, something a modern toxicology report might shed more light on, it is a possibility that should not be ignored. But again, I can see the appeal of focusing on Darlene Farron to unravel the mystery of the shooting at Blue Rock Springs Park with such a secret pass and a web of alleged relationships of varying veracity. But there is another avenue that is far less exciting, and far more obvious that does not appear to have been adequately explored. Looking at the shooting that claimed the life of Darlene Farron, there is one thing that gives me pause in just assuming that she was the person the killer wanted dead, as the shooter, in both sessions, approached the passenger side of her Corvair. While she was shot more times than her passenger, I do find it curious the shooter didn't approach her side of the car. A gunman would be closer, and there wouldn't be another person in the way to obstruct the path. Yet the police stuffed the investigation of the Blue Rock Spring shooting with page after page of inquiries into the life of Darlene Farron, while relatively little consideration was given to the person sitting closest to the shooter, Mike Mijot. The exact nature of the relationship between Mike Mijot and Darlene Farron isn't clear, in stark contrast to David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. Mike's father did mention that Darlene would call the house often, but not why. His father also made a passing mention that Mike's mother had met Darlene, but that also is rather vague. Darlene's parents, though, told the police that she would actually sometimes fear Mike Mijot. Darlene's best friend at work, Bobby, stated that Darlene wasn't dating any of the male regulars but was able to give details of the men Darlene had dated, seemingly very aware of Darlene's romances. Yet, she never even mentions Mike Mijot. If Mike Mijot and Darlene Farron were in a relationship, it apparently would come as a great shock to Darlene's sister, Christina. But since the famous phone call from someone staking claim to both shootings, the narrative of a Lover's Lane shooting would bleed into their story as well, despite the total absence of an established romance. There is something else that puts a damper on the Lover's Lane angle that has been shackled to their story. Mike Mijot's attire that night. Though Thomas Henry Horn was not the first to suggest a nefarious explanation for Mike Mijot's multiple layers of clothes, he is the one that has consistently recognized its significance. While others have bought into at least one of the many dubious rationales, Thomas Henry Horn has maintained that multiple layers of clothes is a hallmark that of a burglar as this allows the thief to quickly change their description if they're spotted. Just walk around a corner, shed a layer of clothes, and now you no longer match the description of a suspect in the area. While I never doubted this tactic to be true, I wanted to verify with other sources for my own edification. Sure enough, as far back as 1919, the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology lists changing clothes as a characteristic of burglary. And here a newspaper article from 1921 when a burglar began removing layers of clothes when caught by police. 
There are also references that are air-appropriate to the 60s for police to be rightly suspicious of someone dressed warmly on a hot day. This was July 4th, after all. Even to present time, burglars are doing exactly what Thomas Henry Horan has said all along, shedding a layer of clothes to alter their appearance to confuse investigators. Here's one from 2013. Sound familiar? If you've read the files, you know that Mike Mijot had already been arrested for theft and gave police false information upon his arrest. Mike Mijot's criminal record has only grown longer as the years have passed and has occasionally been a topic of discussion. But I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Thomas Henry Horn also notes two other elements that fit with this explanation. One being it was the night of July 4th, with much of the town in attendance of the parade and festivities, leaving homes unattended for significant amounts of time. The other, that he was employed by his father at his pest control company. I'm not sure how the clients of Doyen Pest Control would feel about Mike being on the premises. And what's really odd is that if the police files are to be believed, no one with Solano County Sheriff's Office or Vallejo PD ever followed up on why Mike Mijot was wearing three pairs of pants, one t-shirt, three sweaters, and one long sleeve button shirt. They never even asked him almost as if they didn't need to. I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to consult with a local detective without mentioning Zodiac by only stating the facts of the murder. He also verified the connection to wearing layers to burglary, further solidifying when I revealed the victim also had a record for theft. And he did find it very surprising that investigators at the time made absolutely no effort to follow that lead in a shooting. There is a tendency for people to turn a blind eye to the possible sins of Mike Mijot slanted to his survival of a shooting. Some people refer to this as victim blaming, but declaring the examination into wrongdoing of Mike Mijot or Darlene Farron off limits does nothing to solve the mystery of her murder. Remember, there is no proof that Mike was up to something nefarious, but I'm just not sure he isn't culpable in some way for what happened in the parking lot that night. Despite the rather innocent portrayal of Blue Rock Springs Park in the media, with the worst irritation to local law enforcement being teenagers with firecrackers, Thomas Henry Horn has maintained that Blue Rock Springs Park was actually a spot that young people could go and score some narcotics, weed, maybe even amphetamines, which is certainly plausible. After all, it was Mike Mijot that told police he got the impression it was a cop that was walking towards the vehicle. And sure enough, the biggest surprise in all of this was the fact that there was not one, but two police officers present that night, just prior to the murder. One cop there before the shooting, and also first to reach Darlene's car, was Richard Hoffman, who worked in the juvenile division of Vallejo PD, and was patrolling in plainclothes that night. His report puts him in the parking lot of Blue Rock Springs Park at 11.55. The other was a deputy in Solano County Sheriff's Office named Ben Villarreal, who can also be found in the Lake Herman Road files. He worked narcotics and the fact that a narcotics officer was making note of activity in the park that night gives credence to this claim of drug trafficking. As it appears, law enforcement was well aware of illegal activity at Blue Rock Springs Park after dark. John Lynch even requested Deputy Villarreal provide a copy of his report of everything he witnessed in the parking lot that night, which is a report that is either missing or was never typed. In fact, arrests would happen in the late hours at Blue Rock Springs Park well after the murder of Darlene Farron, a very shady character found there with highly questionable stories, some of which had large amounts of cash on their person. I think anyone in law enforcement would have very well-founded suspicions of just what exactly they were doing. And remember, Andy, who was stopped driving away from Blue Rock Springs Park quite slowly, was actually arrested that night, but it is never revealed why he went to the park that night, something I do wonder about. On the night of July 4th, however, the two officers reported parking lot rosters taken prior to the murder and don't line up very well, if at all. Richard Hoffman reports no vehicles present in the parking lot at 11.55, which would include Darlene's Corvair not being present, or the people lighting fireworks, which may become important later. Ben Villarreal was also observing Blue Rock Springs Park just before midnight until being sent on another call, deny seeing Darlene's Corvair as well, but did see other cars. And the three teenagers that stumble across Mike Mijot laying outside the Corvair put the time they arrive in the park as close to midnight, possibly a little before, 
and I'd also be very curious to know why they were really going to Blue Rock Springs Park. And remember, George heard the shooting and a car drive away burning rubber about midnight. This puts the shooting about 12 a.m. July 5th, possibly a little before. While I should probably do a separate video that explores aligning the timetables of all involved parties. The short version is that Mike and Darlene should have arrived in Blue Rock Springs Park sometime between 11.50 and 11.55, not giving much time for events to unfold as Mike Majot told investigators on July 6th. And curiously, both Richard Hoffman and Ben Villarreal deny seeing Darlene's brown Corvair, despite Mike Majot and Darlene rolling into the parking lot several minutes before the shooting, according to Mike's story. But Deputy Villarreal did radio information that he had seen a 1967 Ford sedan next to the spot Darlene's Corvair was found, just before midnight. If there was another car to be on the search for, it would be this blue Ford. Since Ben Villarreal wasn't present at the scene, it makes me wonder how he knew where her car was parked. Ultimately, I find it quite extraordinary that none of those people saw each other in the minutes leading up to the shooting, which leads us back to Mike's story about what happened that night. Granted, minutes after being shot and nearly killed might not be the best moment for someone to perfectly recall events, but it should be noted that his story when questioned on the afternoon of July 6 changes ever so slightly. What was relayed to the police that night was Darlene and Mike had just arrived, brown car, no direction of travel, lone gunman. There was no mention of a first encounter with the car pulling in behind them and driving off. Again. I don't discount the condition of Mike Mijot when police arrive on the scene, but nevertheless, his story does change. Not helping matters is that as far as I'm concerned, Mike Mijot has a major credibility problem. On July 6th, Mike Mijot would go on to tell investigators his version of what happened leading up to Darlene's murder. His story seems to be okay up until here. This phone call, which establishes him being home at 10.30, I find curious as Darlene's sister Christina was with Darlene, and this was about the time they were leaving Caesars and arriving at Terry's restaurant, with Christina specifically stating that at no time did Darlene speak to anyone other than the waitresses. And Bobby, Darlene's friend at Terry's, also said that Darlene did not speak to anyone other than fellow waitresses while she was there. Is it possible Darlene slipped away for a moment at Caesars to make a phone call to Mike? Sure but neither Dean Farron or Bill Lee make any mention of phone calls she may have made. Mike being home for that supposed phone call would be one of the parts of his story I would want to verify. He goes on to claim she picked him up from his house, again, something I would make an effort to check out, and they drove to grab some dinner. Particularly odd given that this was not what Darlene had told her family prior to leaving. She told everyone she was going out to get some things for a party, which just highlights that Mike Mijot may not be completely truthful of the events leading up to Blue Rock Springs Park. After being picked up from his house by Darlene, he then claims that Darlene turned around on Springs Road, close to Mr. Ed's restaurant for Blue Rock Springs Park, to talk. Yet apparently they didn't talk about anything. And this is where it gets interesting. Mike Michaud states that neither one of them had eaten and were both hungry, and yet Darlene's autopsy revealed that her stomach was full of undigested food meaning she must have eaten within one to two hours prior to her murder. While none of the waitresses questioned mentioned that Darlene had eaten, the time frame puts her at Caesar's restaurant, so it is possible she ate a meal there. Or did her and Mike actually go eat somewhere? And if so, where? Regardless, since she had eaten prior to the shooting, I do find Mike's claim that they were both hungry, as they had not eaten, and his denial of actually going to the restaurant with Darlene to be very suspect. Continuing with his story, a car then pulls up behind them he claims was similar to Darlene's Corvair, whose color is unknown. But interestingly, Ben Villarreal had little difficulty identifying the make and color of a sedan just before midnight, and from further away. Mike Mijot would also state there was only one person in this mystery car, but with the caveat, as far as he could tell. This is the type of statement I think may have harmed this investigation as it gives the impression something definite has been established. A similar type of statement would be made by Mike days later. We don't know for certain how many people were in the car that pulled in behind them and drove off, assuming it happened and is connected to the shooting. And Mike Mijot never even claims to have knowledge of the number of occupants in the car during the shooting, and I don't see any reason to just assume there was only one person. And let's not forget that Mike Mijot references fireworks in his statement. Yep, I'm going to be questioning this also. He claims that he was present in the parking lot when people were lighting them off, 
and George Bryant's statement corroborates this happening. While the time he heard the fireworks isn't specific in his statement. Reading George's account gives the impression this occurred closer to 11.30 than midnight, the time of the shooting. Yet Mike told investigators they arrived in the park not long before the shooting. I don't think it would have hurt for the police to clarify with George an approximate time between the fireworks and the gunshots. Just how long was Mike in the parking lot that night? On top of all of this, we have yet another major problem with this statement. Mike Mijot was still in the hospital, in the ICU, on pain medication, and sedated. In fact, he was falling asleep by the time the interview was over. Hardly an ideal time to question the living witness. Also of note, there was a brown vehicle that pulled in behind the Corvair briefly and drove off. That being the teenagers that found Mike Mijot. I find it interesting that the police seemed to question everyone they could about Darlene Farron. Family, friends, employers, co-workers, former lovers, babysitters. Yet they only questioned Mike Mijot's immediate family. The only other person that might have been able to shed more light on Mike's character, his co-worker, doesn't appear to have ever been contacted. Could it be Mike Mijot's questionable attire that night gave him a reason to be less than truthful with Solano County investigators? A number of people have remarked that after all of these years, no one would have cared if he came clean about his petty crimes, so he would have admitted to it by now. But I'm not sure he even knows what happened in the park that night. While I have considered tracking him down to speak with him, after watching an interview in the mid-2000s, it's pretty obvious he no longer remembers what happened, now making statements that he had to wait nine hours for the police arrive to the park, and contradicting nearly every statement he's ever made about that night. It makes me wonder if he ever truly remembered what happened. He was lucky to have survived at all. There are suspicions that Mike Mijot knows more than he leads on, and clearly knowing how dangerous this person or persons were, elected to offer as little help as possible to investigators, fearing for his life. Ed Rust, one of the officers that questioned Mike Mijot, has stated he felt that Mike was holding back information and knew more about what happened that night. But oddly, Ed Rust would later retract this comment. Despite being shown probably every mugshot from Solano County, he never identified anyone. He left town not long after being discharged from the hospital and went into hiding. While years later, Mike Mijot would point a finger at Arthur Lee Allen via photograph. Maybe he genuinely believed that was the man that shot him, or maybe he just wanted investigators to stop bothering him. It ultimately went nowhere. Even the officer who was able to question Mike Mijot further knew that his testimony wouldn't stand a chance in court. Again, like in the Lake Herman Road shooting, I have to wonder just what exactly were they doing in that parking lot? And what were all the other witnesses doing there? Mike's own statement about going there to talk is flimsy enough on its own. And I'm not too sure about his story about why and where he was when Darlene picked him up. For all we know, Mike Mijot could have already been in the parking lot when Darlene arrived. I don't think it's a coincidence that Mike Mijot was wearing multiple layers of clothes the night he was shot. I don't think it's a coincidence that Blue Rock Springs Park also appeared to be home of illegal activity after the sun went down. And I don't think it's a coincidence that a narcotics officer had their eye on the park that night. Given the shooting happened around midnight, Richard Hoffman being at Blue Rock Springs Park at 11.55 aligns perfectly with Mike Mijot's story about a car pulling in behind them five minutes before the shooting. Could it actually have been Richard Hoffman in that mystery car? despite his curious claim of no cars present in the lot. It is astonishing that moments after two police officers leave the area, someone happens to roll into the park and attempts a double homicide. And once again, Thomas Henry Horn makes an interesting observation. As sure enough, there was a drug dealer in Vallejo at that time that dealt with stolen goods, trading them for narcotics while being surveilled by Solano County Sheriff's Office throughout 1969 and had been implicated by a witness in the murder of a man thought to be a snitch, shot in the trunk of a car, with the pistol handed off, instructing his accomplices to participate. According to court documents, he would also monitor police radio transmissions. And last but not least, he happened to have what many would consider to be a large face. Remember, Thomas Henry Horan never accuses anyone of murder, as there is no proof that a drug dealer had anything to do with the shooting at Blue Rock Springs Park. Thomas Henry Horn only highlights these properties to show how a remarkably green pasture of leads could have easily been fruitful. And yet, as far as we can tell, investigators opted not to pursue them at all. And if you recall, 
It was Thomas Henry Horn's theory that a gung-ho narcotics officer in Napa County, using the guise of the psychotic killer the newspapers had already campaigned for, authored the letters to major newspapers in order to draw attention to these unsolved murders, with investigation that supposedly perplexed Solano County officials. And I'm certainly beginning to see his point. It does appear something funny is going on. Do we know that the shooting is directly related to Mike's questionable attire and the drug deal at Blue Rock Springs Park? No. But I think the stars are aligned perfectly for that to be the case. And then there are the telephone calls made to police and family members. The one thing that should be noted is that it was never determined definitively that the killer made the call to police that night. That is an assumption, not a statement of established fact. Even initial newspaper articles were a little more responsible with that piece of information, much like in the murder of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen, but over time, it simply morphed into a fact of the case. The truth is we don't know who made that call, and I do find it suspect. As curiously, it was made at 12.40 a.m., well after the shooting, and in fact Darlene Farron had just been pronounced dead at Kaiser Hospital at that time. Something worth exploring. People need to realize that these murders did not happen in a vacuum. The outside world did exist, and there was a time crank calls were a thing, something probably lost on the youth of today. Not every crank call police would receive would be newsworthy, so the truth of how prevalent they were may be skewed. But attempts to combat them were newsworthy. Remember, Pierre Bedeau told an interviewer that when he first got radioed to return to Lake Herman Road, not only did they think it was a crank call, but a crank call about an automobile accident, something relatively mundane. And there were plenty of crank calls made by people claiming to be the Zodiac, and some even threatening to kill children in Palo Alto. My point is, we don't need to pretend it is beyond the pale for someone in the world to find making phony calls to police a source of amusement or gratification. Perhaps most telling is the fact that the three teenagers who were the first to call the police about 1210 actually thought the police considered their call to be a crank and didn't believe them. They then went to a relative's house, an off-duty police officer, and someone in that party called the police to re-report the crime. And I would be very curious to know when and who exactly called the police again, and what was told to Nancy Slover. It is important to note that the version of the phone call in newspapers is different than what was documented in the police files. In one sentence appears to be completely made up, as nowhere in the files is it indicated that the caller actually said, I shot them. What's more, the reporter seems to have changed the wording in one portion of the call. In the files, the statement in the call reads, I want to report a double murder. If you go one mile east on Columbus Parkway to the public park, you will find the kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I argue there is a distinct difference between the two renditions, as in one version the caller directly claims responsibility, and in the other he does not. It is an extraordinary coincidence that the teenagers were left under the impression they weren't believed, and a little while later, Vallejo PD received another call, but this time from someone who offers proof of a shooting, proof that ostensibly would have to come from the killer. It is only the last sentence that adds the implication that the caller is responsible for the shooting at Blue Rock Springs Park. I also killed those kids last year, to which he offers absolutely zero information, not even which kids he's referring to. I question if they were referring to the ammo or actual weapon itself, as even the police report notes the absence of an exact copy of the wording from the call. I would be curious to know if the caller said with a Luger 9mm or with Luger 9mm as that small difference of wording matters greatly. Was the caller referring to the weapon or the caliber? A Luger is synonymous with 9mm, so it does seem a bit gratuitous to specify a Luger as 9mm. The casings found on the scene were stamped as Luger 9mm. It also just so happens that the weapon used during the murder, in the absence of knowing the exact pistol, would come to be documented in the police report as 9mm Luger. At this point though, we really are splitting hairs. Apart from the possibility of overhearing the information of Luger 9mm ammo at the scene, mistaking that for the weapon, many have noted that it was not uncommon for civilians to listen to police chatter over a scanner. The Black Panther Party in the mid-60s would monitor police broadcasts over the radio and arrive on the scene to make sure the apprehended were aware of their rights before being jailed. 
Tom Balmer, the reporter that arrived on the scene at the shooting of Lake Herman Road, claimed that he heard about the shooting while monitoring police radio transmissions. And it turns out that almost all of the information found in the famous call had indeed been broadcast over the radio. It has been suggested that police would not have transmitted victim names over the radio, which is interesting because the caller never mentioned any names. But it does appear that at some point they may have transmitted an address when trying to determine the owner of the Corvair. There was also a telephone call made to Darlene's in-laws, Dean's parents, who lived on Monterey Street. This happened about 1.30 a.m., with no one replying on the other end, only the sound of someone breathing. In the files regarding that night, Darlene's address was erroneously listed twice. Once on Beechwood, the street Mike lived on, and the other, sure enough, was Monterey Street. The source of this misinformation seems to be from the registration of the Corvair, which was registered in the name of Dean's father, Arthur Farron, at Monterey Street. It's not clear how responders received the address the Corvair was registered to, so I wonder if that information was transmitted over the radio. Also very coincidentally, a reporter looked up the address in the telephone directory for the July 5th article, seemingly to confirm part of the story. And interestingly, a newspaper report would also publish Monterey Street as being the home of Darlene Farron. So that misinformation of a connection between Darlene Farron and the residence of Dean's parents was out there. For some amount of time that night, this was thought to be where she lived. Could that call be in some way connected to investigators or a reporter trying to contact what was thought to be her home? Could someone have overheard a radio transmission relaying the address the Corvair was registered to? And very coincidentally, about that same time, 1.30 a.m., is when Dean had come home to Virginia Street with friends for a party, only to discover that Darlene wasn't home yet. It's interesting to note the alignment of these two events happening about the same time. Could the telephone call have something to do with that? But there were also two telephone calls made to Darlene's house on Virginia Street between 1.30 a.m. and 2 a.m. with no one answering on the other end. There is supposedly an interview with Darlene's brother Leo, in which he admits it was he that had called the house, trying to get a hold of Darlene regarding some marijuana. Ultimately, I don't know if this is true or not, but I could see why Leo might hang up the phone if Darlene isn't the one that answers, not wanting to raise eyebrows with a late night call. This call about marijuana also fits with the suspected motivation of Darlene going to Blue Rock Springs Park in the first place, to obtain some. My point is, Despite the claim that the call to Darlene's in-laws must have been from the killer, and he must have known Darlene, we can see that this is far from the only explanation, as both investigators and reporters believe their house to be home for Darlene, at least for a time that night. And if the address the Corvair was registered to was broadcast over radios, there's no way of knowing who else knew. Ultimately though, there doesn't appear to be an official record of what was and what wasn't transmitted over police radios. Can I prove the call to police was a crank call? No. But it's definitely not the slam dunk it has been portrayed as. If investigators weren't impressed with the facts stated in the letters, they would hardly be impressed by the telephone call. Yet, it's been maintained that all of the calls to police, Darlene's house, and her in-laws, all were from the killer in order to taunt them, despite the lack of any proof. Sure, it's possible that the killer made all these calls. And I admit, I don't have the power of mind reading that some people seem to have, but those rational explanations, as frail as they may seem in the face of what we've always been told repeatedly for years, are far more reasonable than the killer calling the cops on themselves and then making more phone calls to family members later that night. Much like in the Lake Herman Road murders, the police files reveal that there actually were leads in the murder of Darlene Farron, with a couple of them being quite interesting, and don't seem to have been satisfactorily resolved. Remember, these tips were received before the letters start arriving to newspapers. One lead was offered third-hand, by someone's neighbor relaying some information they were told about their neighbor's son having been contacted by somebody looking to leave town, claiming they had been involved in a shooting. The police followed the trail, having went to the neighbor who confirmed that they had told the tipster this, and that their son Donald knew this person supposedly involved in a double shooting. She gave a description, short, heavy set, brown car. But what really interested me was a possible connection to narcotics, something investigators overlooked. 
Yet despite her knowledge of this person, she is conveniently unable to recall a name she heard only a couple of days prior. She also told Vallejo PD that her daughter heard her son discuss this possible suspect as well. This isn't your typical gossip. There is specific information given that aligns with several aspects of the case. A few days later, Ed Rust questions Donald, whose reaction to the information given to investigators by his mother was complete denial. Basically, I don't know what in the world she's talking about, and maybe he doesn't. But they never asked the daughter if that conversation ever took place to contradict or confirm if Donald had ever spoken of this person. That lead was allowed to die there. Yet, there is another Donald that was questioned by police on July 11th. This possible suspect is also very interesting, but not because of what he said, but something that will later happen to him. It's not immediately clear why investigators detained Donald for questioning, something I would like to know for sure, regarding a box of 9mm ammo and his whereabouts on the night of July 4th. But based on the street he lived on, I have reason to believe police have referred to this potential suspect before as a tip from the public. He admits buying a box of Winchester Western 9mm in Solano County back in June, claiming they were for a friend on parole who had a 9mm pistol in San Francisco. He then met up with his friend in the city, where they shot half the box into the ocean. And very curiously, Donald apparently brought the box of Winchester Western back home with them, instead of leaving them with his friend that owned a 9mm. Regarding his whereabouts on the night of July 4th, Donald states he was in San Jose, which is only an hour away, to meet a friend named Joe, where he stayed at a motel he couldn't remember, under a fictitious name he couldn't remember. Truly a terrible alibi. But he claims they had spent a large chunk of the trip at a billiards hall, and that could be verified with the owner, something John Lynch appears to have never done. So even if he did spend time at Campus Billiards, we don't know the exact times and dates he was there. And that was that. Until investigators got a call July 21st at 12.30 a.m. from Solano County Sheriff Deputy Ben Villarreal, who again worked with narcotics, informing that Donald had just been arrested, found in his possession, was a semi-automatic P-38 with the round in the chamber. This page may be the only documentation of that arrest that exists today, so the full details may never be known for sure. Thomas Henry Horan has proposed that the arrest of Donald appears to be some sort of trap, and reading the report, I tend to agree. He shows up at a house with a friend named James, who has since passed away, looking for some guy. Knock on the door, no one answers, they both turn to leave, where they are immediately confronted by Solano County Sheriff's Office. And as they are being arrested, Donald turned to his friend James, declaring he was going to be booked for murder, implying he realized he had just been set up. It sure appears that Solano County Sheriff's Office knew that Donald was going to show up at a specific house and have a 9mm pistol in his possession. Upon questioning, once again Donald claimed he was in San Jose on July 4th, and the P-38 actually belonged to a friend he refused to name. The P-38 was sent to Sacramento for ballistics comparison with recovered casings and slugs from the murder of Darlene Farron. Testing began on July 24th, which becomes important. For a long time, Thomas Henry Horn had assumed that this Donald was a man that was friends with Darlene, and also a very unsavory character. When I figured out who Donald actually was, and that the Donald arrested was a different Donald, I let Thomas Henry Horn know, and he and I had a friendly competition of who could get him on the phone. What's very strange about this is that no one, not even Robert Graysmith, ever reached out to him to discuss his arrest found in the file of Darlene Farron's murder. No one. Until he spoke to Thomas Henry Horan in July 2019. He released an entire episode about his conversation with Donald that very few were interested in, which is unfortunate because at the time of this recording has since been taken down. Now all of this happened 50 years ago, so it's difficult to gauge the accuracy of the information, as he genuinely might not remember events correctly, and he still might not be completely honest. So take the information with a huge grain of salt. But he now claims that the P-38 was his all along. Which fits, since he always had the box of 9mm Winchester Western in his possession. Also, sources have indicated that James was becoming heavily involved in narcotics about the time of the arrest, and would later die of a drug overdose, leaving the history of drug use in question surrounding Donald. But the big question here was just when exactly was he released from jail, because again, it's the timing of all of this that's important. While we are allowed to know that Donald was questioned about a box of Winchester Western 9mm he purchased and his whereabouts on July 4th, 
and we are allowed to know that Donald was arrested in the early hours of July 21st with a P-38 that was sent to Sacramento to determine if it was the murder weapon, we are not allowed to know the results. All we have is the first page of the determination. Given all we are allowed access, particularly when possible suspects are eliminated through paths such as alibis and simple weapons checks, it does seem odd that we would not be allowed to know that Donald's P-38 came back as not a match, leaving me to wonder if it in fact was a possible match, which would be reason to redact them, since he was never charged or convicted. When I filed a request with the FBI to get the missing pages of the results, I was given a form for Donald to sign so they could be released, something I don't quite have the brass to do. But ultimately, the test results are uncertain to us, and Donald admitted he left town after being released. Missing pages from the results also mean that we don't know exactly when testing was completed, or when Vallejo PD received this form. Remember, there is absolutely zero proof that Donald had anything to do with the shooting at Blue Rock Springs Park, and has never been accused of murder by anyone. It's the timing that's important. The story that everyone knows is that Darlene Farron was murdered, police have no leads or suspects, and the letters start to arrive at area newspapers from someone taking credit for these murders out of the clear blue nearly a month later. However, two interesting things did happen right before Zodiac letters are mailed. Looking at the ballistics test from the Lake Herman Road murders, the results took five calendar days, or three business days to complete. I don't think it's unreasonable to apply that three-day time frame to the testing of the P-38 with recovered casings and slugs, which puts the results in police hands about July 29th. Two days later, three letters are mailed to area newspapers from someone ostensibly saying, I am the murderer. And here is the proof. The other question I have is just when exactly was Donald released from jail? Before the letters or after? Because again, whether the P-38 came back as not a match, or a possible match, either way, the timing of the test results appear to align with the first letters, as if the person writing knew about all of this. Making me wonder if this event with Donald and his P-38, something the public wouldn't know about, is what compelled someone to start writing letters claiming to be the murderer. But there was something else that happened right before the letters arrived. As far as the public was concerned, the murders on Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs were certainly connected, but you would never know it reading the police files, as it doesn't appear there was ever any attempt by investigators to link them. From my vantage point though, there is in fact one possible connection. Before the Zodiac letters, there was another anonymous letter received on July 25th from someone pointing to a man named Charles, described as 22, short, and heavyset, living at the Pink House at Lake Herman and also claimed he was very capable of committing both the Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs Park murders. The alleged house Charles lived at appears to be the same house that was the site of the marijuana bust immediately before or during the shooting of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. Since there was never a possible connection between their murders and events at that house in newspapers, or the police files for that matter, I argue this might be the best lead investigators stumbled into. On July 26, Mike Mijot is shown a mugshot of Charles at the hospital, and he again uses the phrase, to the best of his knowledge, which does not instill a great deal of confidence in his answer. In other words, there is still a possibility that Charles was responsible. So on July 28th, John Lynch went to the cottage off Lake Herman Road and found that the house was padlocked and apparently deserted. And at 5.02 p.m., that lead is concluded to the satisfaction of investigators. I'll let you decide if that effort leaves anything to be desired. After returning to the hospital, and showing Mike Mijot more mugshots and reviewing the entire case becomes fruitless, the investigation is more or less over at this point, 6 p.m., July 28th, as these are the final entries in the case. Until only a couple of days later, three copies of a letter are mailed to newspapers claiming responsibility, along with the cipher that will bring these cases back to front page news. I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest something happened that compelled a person to start writing letters about these murders in the first place, instead of just arbitrarily picking July 31st to pick up a pen and paper. And the two things that happen right before Zodiac letters start rolling in are the arrest of a possible suspect and the lead towards an actual link between the shooting at Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs Park. And the letters also happen to coincide with the investigation of Darlene Farron's murder, Growing Cold. Maury Terry. A controversial author did make an interesting observation about the investigation. 
stating, The phone call immediately linked the murders of Faraday and Jensen, and led the police to believe that it was a psychopath at work, and it stopped the search for a real motive in the murder of Darlene Farron. He was half right. It wasn't the phone call that made investigators abandon the pursuit of a motive. It was the letters. As I discussed in my first video, there are indications that the author of the original Zodiac letters did indeed have the police reports. If you recall, the first letters were able to perfectly mimic the positional descriptions of both David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen found in the Benicia police report. They're even in the same order. I also discussed the genesis of all this for Thomas Henry Horan. The arrest that was made that night of a young man caught by police driving away quite slowly from Blue Rock Springs Park something that the killer wouldn't know about. But Richard from ZodiacCiphers.com has shrewdly observed something else. In the same portion of the letter, the author used the term squealing tires when contradicting reports in the newspapers. While that term doesn't actually appear in the published statements, interestingly, it does appear in the police files and George Bryant's statement to investigators, something the killer wouldn't know about. After doing some more digging, sure enough, there's more. It should also be noted that one of the facts Zodiac included in his letters was wrong. Darlene Farron was not wearing pants. She was actually wearing some type of dress. While there has been a debate about what exactly she was wearing that night, and if it could have appeared to someone she was wearing slacks, Zodiac still got it wrong. And curiously, her dress is one of the very few articles of clothing from the Vallejo victims absent from public view. Only a portion of her dress has been released, showing it was in fact patterned as Zodiac claimed but the entirety of it is still hidden from public view. Almost as if there were a concerted effort to give the appearance Zodiac was only correct in his stated facts by displaying just the pattern of the dress, while obscuring something he was wrong about. Thomas Henry Horan also discusses a possible explanation for this error. While a written record of what Darlene was wearing is found in the text of the police files, the actual log was misaligned, leaving a portion of the description of what she was wearing muddy and someone may have misread this clear portion as slacks, dress. As in, dress slacks. Simply, a pair of slacks. It also just so happens that within the text of the police files, it is written that Darlene was wearing pants. But in the British sense, pants, as in panties. And if the slack dress entry could be transcribed as slacks, in essence, the police files list both pants and slacks for Darlene's wardrobe. And remarkably, so do the Zodiac letters. The one article of clothing Zodiac mentions also happens to be the one that is garbled on the property record for Darlene Farron, coupled with her undergarment actually being referred to as pants. It is odd that he didn't mention anyone else's clothing. Or did he? In the second letter, Zodiac tells a story about a black man being the one that informed the police the perpetrator's car was brown, making special note of the man's clothing and how he was dressed. There is no record about this being the case in the police files, so it appears to be a complete fabrication. But someone did tell the police that the killer was driving a brown car. Mike Mijot, who sure enough, was oddly dressed, wearing several layers of clothes that night. A fact that was present in the files, yet the police seemed to look the other way, and definitely was left out of newspapers. While the shooter could have noticed Mike was wearing a layer under his button shirt, which isn't noteworthy in any way. I just can't see how the murderer would have known Mike was actually wearing five layers and three pairs of pants. I argue Mike Mijot's irregular wardrobe is something the real killer wouldn't have known about. And I haven't forgotten about the 408. Found in the solved text of the cipher is the phrase, it is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. For years, it has been a given that this was only a movie reference to the most dangerous game, thanks to the influence of Robert Graysmith, no doubt, coloring the personality of Zodiac. In the newspapers, it was briefly mentioned that there were weapons checks made of guns owned by locals in the area. However, the police files tell us a little more, and reveal that these weapons checks were actually of firearms used by hunters that were out off Lake Herman Road the night David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen were shot. Hunting near the pumping station, and were using 22 long rifle. While the author could indeed be making a movie reference, I can't help but wonder if he was really alluding to the hunters out stalking wild game in the forest off Lake Herman Road and questioned by police. 
Though it was a long shot, investigators were procedurally correct in fulfilling the need to eliminate the hunters out that night as suspects, something the killer wouldn't have known about. Also in the cipher, the author makes a claim that the people he killed will become his slaves in the afterlife. While it's true these could simply be the machinations of a psychotic killer, he was very specific in referring to the afterlife as paradise. This no doubt feeds the imagination of readers further, of a deranged person on the loose. But Vallejo did get a very good tip that appears to have come from a very notable person from Stanford Research Menlo Park, Fred Turman, the father of Silicon Valley. Having recognized the mantra in the cipher, he contacted Vallejo, informing them that indigenous peoples in Southeast Asia share the same belief, particularly in Mindanao in the southern Philippines. For a long time, I was never able to find a good source to verify this, until I came across a declassified military paper from the 80s that covers American involvement in the Philippines during World War II. Native guerrilla fighters were given direct support and training by U.S. forces to help combat Japanese occupiers, and in the process encountered these beliefs held by the Moro people, that those they kill would be their slaves, waiting to serve them in an afterlife they refer to as Paradise, with a capital P. But more specifically, it was each Christian they kill, a concept that was very unpopular with U.S. personnel, and would perhaps be even less well received back home in the States. In fact, it is reported that the Moros have even attacked U.S. Army men for this very reason. I can't help but think that this little detail of an ally's holy war against Christians was kept very hush-hush, since it is not well known, even in the information age. What's funny about the text in the cipher, though, is it appears a word is missing, as it reads, all the I have killed will become my slaves. Since Zodiac is more known for his misspellings than missing words, it could be argued that he deliberately, maybe even carefully, omitted a word. Dave Orenshack also discusses the possibility that the 408 is missing an entire line from the cipher, something I feel is certainly plausible. There is an alternative explanation, that there isn't a missing word at all. The letters T-H-E-I together do in fact spell a word, this is actually an old spelling of the word, thy. All thy have killed. Then again, maybe he simply forgot a word. Or maybe he didn't. My point is, Fred Turman provided a very good lead to investigators about the reference of those killed to become slaves for the afterlife, for paradise, having a connection to Southeast Asia and the Philippines. It fits perfectly. Even though Vallejo had a large Filipino population, there was a very good reason for the tip to be documented in the files. Sure enough, also present in the files, it just so happens that one of the suspects, George Waters, was actually from the Philippines. Just as the hoax theory suggests, there are plenty of indications that the author of the letters had access to the police files. Not only does Zodiac know information about the murders, but he also appears to be very well acquainted with the details of the investigations. Topically, the first three letters that state facts are what offers proof of a murderer, but it is the information hidden in the cipher that came with them, once solved, coupled with information hidden in plain sight in the requested second letter, that makes it apparent that the author knew an awful lot, more than the killer would know. I think Thomas Henry Horan may be more right than he realized. While the hoax theory does note the many differences in the individual murders, things like suspect descriptions, MOs, murder weapons, victim profiles, fingerprints, and a lack of any physical evidence to connect them, it does not cite these characteristics as proof of different perpetrators, despite the claim of critics and something of a straw man, though it could be argued all indications lean that way. I don't deny the possibility that it could all be the work of one man. But all of the dissimilarities and lack of correlating evidence completely fail to offer proof it was indeed the same man. Even though the Zodiac letters contain erroneous information, lies, and threats he would never make good on, we are expected to believe his declaration that he is solely responsible for the deaths he claims. While detractors will concede to the dissimilarities in each murder, maintain that all of the murders were the same person by default, in the absence of proof it was different persons, which the hoax theory admits it does not provide. Regardless, there should be evidence of a serial killer, not the other way around. Proof of non-serial killings. It's only the letters that link the murder of Betty Lou Jensen, David Faraday, Darlene Farron, and Paul Stein. 
I had planned to cover the double stabbing at Lake Berryessa, but the current climate has brought my research to a screeching halt. As it turns out, there is actually another suspect in that murder. I will explore the death of Paul Stein, and the letters surrounding his murder, including the shirt piece. On my video regarding the murders on Lake Herman Road, people very curiously jumped to the shirt piece mailed October 13th. My question is, how does a piece of Paul Stein's shirt prove the letter writer murdered David Faraday? The answer, of course, is it doesn't, but it is perceived to. While looking into if there may have been some investigative or procedural reason for police to remove part of Paul Stein's shirt, I came across a court case that highlights the influence a bloody piece of a victim's clothing has over people. In the mid-30s, there was an objection to the prosecutor of a murder suspect waving around a piece of the victim's bloody shirt during trial, demanding justice for the deceased before the jury. It was noted that the bloody shirt added nothing to connect the accused to the murder, and was actually a spectacle calculated to prejudice the jury, and could only serve to excite the minds and inflame the passion of the jury. Admittedly, this particular case has no connection to the Zodiac murders. I only cite it as it highlights the limits of irrational thinking, and how easy it is to sway our interpretations with a piece of bloody clothing. In other words, the effect the presence of bloody clothing has is well established, and is applicable to the example of Paul Stein's bloody shirt seen in the eyes of many as guilt to the murder of David Faraday, or any of the other Zodiac victims. And there is another interesting aspect of the shirt piece being mailed in, that I've only heard Thomas Henry Horan mention. The psychological effect of the letters themselves is quite profound, as the bad handwriting and misspelled words have become a trope of serial killers, evoking imagery of a childlike but brilliant psychotic killer on a path only to satisfy his homicidal urges. A monster. Our imaginations run wild, filling the void created by the unknown. Much like in horror films, it is not what we see that scares us, but rather it is what we don't see that truly terrifies. Yet as I discussed in my first video, it appears the crude handprinting and even misspellings may simply be the byproduct of how the author disguised his writing. Nothing more. I'm not suggesting that the author of the Zodiac Letters had masterfully crafted a character so compelling and gripping that it would help shape the way people think of serial killers in the modern world. In fact, I have a hunch it may have been something of an accident. And Robert Graysmith understandably took the character found in the pages of the letters, and ran with it to great success. And it turns out that the absence of Hal Snook's name from Robert Graysmith's first book may not be accidental after all. Thomas Henry Horne has also surmised that they actually knew each other prior to the letters, a theory I feel holds water for a very specific reason, leading me to wonder if Hal Snook could have actually been Graysmith's source. And Thomas Henry Horne is right to be suspicious of just when exactly Robert G. Smith Jr. started sticking his nose in the Zodiac murders. But that's a video for another time. Even the granddaddy of all letters supposedly from killers, the Dear Boss Jack the Ripper letter, has doubts surrounding its authenticity, and influenced many others to follow suit. While experts psychoanalyze a person they've never met, ad nauseum, the very poor reaction, and sometimes even hostility towards the theory that questions the authenticity of Zodiac, has made me come to discover that the psychologists waste their talents on supposed serial killers. As the interesting psychology isn't from the performer of these actions, the real psychology is found in the observer. Coming across the hoax theory has challenged everything I knew, or everything I thought I knew about the Zodiac Killer. While critics decry confirmation bias, if you go in assuming the hoax to be true, you will only recognize evidence to support that. A particularly bold claim, since I started off wanting to prove Thomas Henry Horan wrong. Yet critics often ignore the flip side of the coin. If you go in assuming there was a Zodiac Killer, you will only see evidence to support it. Many have rightly decided to go back to the beginning, to start over. Yet we'll kick off from page one, already assuming that the same man who committed all the murders is the same man who made the telephone calls and is the same man who wrote the letters. There is perhaps no better example of confirmation bias. I am open to being wrong, but so far everything continues to point in the direction of these letters being some sort of fraud, authored only by someone who had access to the police files. And when you look at the murders within the context of a complex world, and out from under the ominous shadow of Zodiac, the fog suddenly lifts, if only a little bit. I have no doubt the murder of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen was narcotics related. And after looking at the murder of Darlene Farron, there are indeed indications that it too was narcotics related. And coincidentally or not, 
The man Thomas Henry Horne considers to be the author of the letters was a gung-ho narcotics officer in Napa. What did the letters accomplish? What would have happened if they were never written? If you're interested, in my next video I will continue to explore the details of Paul Stein's murder, the suspects, and of course the letters. What they tell us, but perhaps more interestingly, what they don't tell us. If nothing else, Thomas Henry Horne's hoax theory has made me realize, of all the components of the Zodiac Killer saga, the real mystery is the letters. I'm Evan from Texas.